Good morning, uh, colleagues and audience, audience members. My name is Ed Weising. I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the City Council. We are here this evening to conduct our third work session on City Council Bill 12 0152, which is Transform Baltimore Zoning. During our second work session held on Wednesday, February the 5th, we completed page 17, page 17 and line 10 of page 34. On today, we will start on line 11 of page 34 and work on as much as we can during today's session, which is two hours. Uh, the Land Use and Transportation Committee intends to work progressively through the bill by reviewing it page by page, starting with Title I and continuing through the bill in the order it is written. City agencies and public will be asked to participate by raising their questions or comments as the committee is discussing the page they have a, a comment or a question regarding. Um, I encourage everyone to visit the City Council's website, which is www baltimorecitycouncil.com to stay updated with the section of that bill that, that, that the committee is working on at each work session. Um, in addition to the currently scheduled series of work sessions, the Land Use and Transportation Committee will likely hold additional hearings and work sessions. Information about those will be distributed to the public as soon as dates, times, and topics are selected. Again, please check the Baltimore City Council website for the most up-to-date information. If you are un unable to attend the scheduled work session and you wish to provide written comments or amendments, please mail it to the Office of Councilmatic Services. Attention to Antoine Banks at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202 or email at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. Um, my, my one grand rule is please turn off your uh, cell phones, iPhones, Androids to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to testify um, during the work session. We are joined by Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark to my far right. To my immediate right is Councilman Jim Kraft, who is the Vice Chair of the Committee. Thank you. To my left is uh, Mr. Antoine Banks, who is staff person. To his left is Mr. John Willis, who is the, uh, the attorney uh, representing the committee. We are also joined by Angela Gibson, representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. And Ms. Kara Kunz to my left, who is representing Bernard, President Bernard Jack Young. We're also joined by, um, to my left in the audience, Andy Smalling, representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins Blake. Um, so now we are on page 34 on line 7. Uh, before we begin, um, uh, Planning, Laurie, do you have something you want to? Yes. And, be, and before you start, before you begin, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to emphasize to those who are speaking into the mic, who are going to testify or, or give reference, is to make sure you, you speak into the microphone because what's happening is that if you don't, if you don't speak into the microphone when they're playing this on uh, video, they cannot hear what you're saying. It's very important that uh, the listening audience is able to hear the audio uh, of, of the work session. So I'd appreciate, again, to make sure that you use the microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two follow-up items from the work session of last week. There were two uh, terms the council asked us to look into uh, the city block.
So recommendation is delete the definition of city block. It has no zoning purpose was, in this text. That, that, was the, that was the question, Councilman Kraft. Councilman Kraft. Yeah. The other one was impervious surface. And, sure, did you? So, um, Mr. Chairman, would we have an agreement that on page um, 17, lines 15 through 18, that we would just remove that definition? Yes. Um, is that, we in agreement on that? Line, As a matter of line form. Line 17, right. um, 15 to 18, and then at some point um, we would have to re-letter the, um, the sub subsequent things. Yeah, we're just, it's not going to exist. Not need to be in the zoning code is our okay. recommendation. All right. Um, the and other, the other terminology. Hold on one second. Okay. Right. So we're all good with that, Councilwoman. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, the other term was impervious surface, and uh, we reviewed the definition as it is now in Article Twenty Seven. Um, and we are comfortable with that, so that's in the stormwater section that has been amended since this was introduced. So again, for clarity across the city codes, we recommend that they be the same and either cross-referenced or repeated based on Article 27. The third term that the- Wait, wait, can't speak, wait, can't speak. Uh, what is, I'm sorry, what is the definition, please, in the um, stormwater code? Article 27, um, I, I copied this out of the online version. I hope this is uh, correct. Uh, in general, impervious surface means any surface that does not allow stormwater to, inf to infiltrate into the ground. Inclusions, impervious surface includes road tops, driveways, sidewalks, or pavement. Exclusions, impervious surface, does not include ballasted railroad tracks. Includes, includes or including means a way of illustration and not by way of limitation. And that is from Article 27 um, at this time. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, the purpose of my uh, proposed amendment to the definition, and I'd be glad to introduce an ordinance to amend stormwater if we could get concurrences, that we're kind of in a limbo, limbo, limbo about what you can use um, as a surface. Uh, for example, for parking. And I think there's an interagency ongoing conference about this that um, I was hoping that we could resolve. And my language um, was purposeful in that it, um, it brings into play industry standards, which I'm not sure are in play yet, um, about what kind of surfaces could be used. So if I might ask the committee, rather than go off on a tangent about that today, let's go off in a tangent about it later on when I have a chance to talk with um, Ms. Collins in her role as stormwater um, intermediary, if that's all right with Ms. Collins. We're comfortable deferring to public works on that matter. Okay, and that's what I will do. And Stephanie, please take note. I have to have a meeting with Marcia Collins. I am. Thank you. And um, and I understand the con I understand the concerns of of the councilwoman on this. Um, I just know that when we created this definition. Um, in the stormwater ordinance, this was a definition that we worked on um, with not just 
uh, the council members, but um, the industry uh, with um, many other people involved to make sure that we were able to uh, um, accommodate all the standards that were being used at that time. So um, that's also, if, and Ms. Collins, please correct me if I'm wrong, this also has, to, if we change these definitions, we have to go back to MDE, or do we have to go back to MDE, or do we have, um, with regard to this particular issue, or um, do we know the answer to that? Thank you, uh, Marcia Collins for the Department of Public Works. Um, we are not, it's not like we have a model ordinance that we need to follow. Our concern is that what is considered impervious for the purposes of a stormwater ordinance um, ties into what the state of Maryland finds acceptable to be uh, either impervious or permeable. Um, and that's really the crux of what uh, the councilwoman is concerned about. Um, I think for the purposes of the zoning code, they're looking at, uh, as I recall from the body of the zoning code, impervious surface comes in when we're looking at what happens within a property, and there were certain percentages in, the, um, in this proposed zoning code that relate specifically to um, how much impervious surface um, there were, okay, I mean, as I recall, and, and Lori can straighten me out on that, but um, so th there may be two slightly divergent purposes in these uh, portions of the code. Um, so I, we just have, that was a hard um, definition to, to get uh, consensus on, uh, so we're being very cautious about what it is. We also have situations where we actually look at specific sites because quite frankly some soils are impermeable in in the city of baltimore so um, it's not a simple thing to define sometimes we have to look at site conditions this is about my issue my issue if i if i may um i i i really concur with what Ms. Collins is saying, basically, we got what we need for stormwater for the moment. But this is the zoning code. And basically, the option that people have is, if it doesn't measure up to the definition in stormwater, they pay a fee. I mean, they're going to pay a fee on that surface, but it's it's for a different purpose for it and, and so they're going to be penalized really in a way on uh, with a fee if it if the state finds that it's that industry standards in some instance or another are not up to their standards the stormwater will they'll they'll charge them by the square footage of it and so it's a different reason not, well, here we are, but. My only, my only issue, and it's an issue that I've raised in, in, in most of our meetings, is for the individual, and I'm not going to talk about stormwater here right now, the stormwater definition. I mean the um, impervious surface, but the, the whole across the board definitions. For a person who goes to the building code, to the stormwater ordinance and to the zoning code and looks at impervious surface in those different ordinances, what we, what we need to have or as close as possible is consistency. And so that's what I think we're all looking for. And while at the end of the day they may have to some degree uh, a different effect or there may be a fee or there may be whatever, I think that a, a person, um, if they meet the definition in one of those ordinances uh, and then they find out at some point later on after they've met that definition, spent their money, done what they've done, 
that they have not complied with the definition in another statute, um, then we've created a problem for them by not having the, the same definition. Yeah, but so the agencies can't come to concurrence about some um, some of the potential surfaces that would meet the guidelines of the stormwater because they are meeting about it a lot. And so I just would like to call the question, I guess. I know that it's all subject to all kinds of things, but, uh, you know, I got people that want to do the right thing. Well. And they don't, there's no way for them to do it. And so, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Vice Chair, you're Mr. Impervious Surface, but I'm going to sit at land use here. Uh, I'm going to sit at land use hearings and listen to you tell people they shouldn't be asphalting their parking lots, and I and they're going to say I got no choice, and I'm going to say what are we doing this for again? So it, we have plenty of time here. Maybe it'll I get agree. resolved. Well, we'll we'll get it worked out. Okay, thank you. Uh, before we before we start on uh, 11 one 308 which is industrial general to lot interior um, if anyone from the from the uh, industrial group or the representatives there's four empty seats up there you could sit up up here if you wish to or you can stay in the audience um, I'll leave it up to you um, so let's look at Page 34, 11 through 33. Uh, if anyone has any amendments or questions, yeah, Councilwoman Clark. Um, I think that members here should have copies of these. Um, they're slightly revised amendments. I start where we start today. Um, yes, I uh, wanted to add a uh, Roman numeral three on after line five. Um, excuse me. Whoa, wait a minute. Did I do this wrong? Oh, I'm on. Oh, I'm all the way down in industrial light. I'm sorry. Hey, you're on page 35. We're on, 30, we're on 34. You're on 35. Oh yeah, you're right. Okay, so now it comes over. Yeah, page 35. Oh, so I'm, okay, but I'm we're sorry. on 30. Yeah, we're on, okay. Oh, I got so 35. you. You're good. Okay. Who else? Who has 34? Microphone. Uh, the Planning Commission received testimony and concurred with that testimony uh, to recommend on line 32 uh, that the word repair be replaced by the word assembly. Uh, that that was a broader, more accurate term for the, um, and this comes from uh, industrial advocates. So you're saying that assembly and repair is going to be, mean the same thing? Assembly is a broader term broader than repair term, includes, and more accurately describes the nature of their work. Okay. Okay. Anyone else on 34, page 34? Okay, thank you. Um, now we are on page 35, which um, we'll start with Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Anyone else have anything on 35? I do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Councilwoman Clark. Um, if I may, uh, page 35 after line five, pardon me for jumping the gun. Um, I'm adding a third, I'm adding a Sorry, I'm trying to really be good about this. Um, uh, page 35, after line five, adding a Roman numeral three under um, um, after conditions. Minimize. Under conditions, um, and that is uh, three. Only minimal truck traffic is required for daily operations. It's the trucks that make people crazy. Go ahead, Councilor Kraft, you want to respond to that? Um, okay. So in the, 
with this being a definition, um, what constitutes minimal truck ta traffic for purposes of a definition? Um, I mean, does minimal mean minimal in the terms of um, the number of trucks per hour, the number of trucks per day, the size of the trucks? I mean, what, what again, when a person looks at this, what do they what do they understand minimal to mean? Our recommendation would be that that would be a standard and then should be more specific in Title 14 where you can, that's typically where you would get into the details, that the minimal trucks is not a definition of industrial light as much as a use standard that would go with that. Again, that's without getting into the Substance, uh, just in terms of form, our suggestion would be that that's a use standard. I would, um, I love redundancy. Um, and so I, I'd like to recommend to the committee that we adopt this. And if, I mean, l let me be, let me just be frank. Go ahead. This is, this document is by and large model of uh, generic uh, definition in many cases. And in many cases, I take exception because of it. So it's only fair that someone take exception to mine. I'll be glad to limit it to, uh, I mean, basically, it's in the eye of the beholder. Minimal truck traffic is going to depend on how many neighbors are nearby and how they yell. And you know it's the truth. That's exactly and, right. and so um, three in the morning well, might be too much in Hamden, in the alley between Elm and, and Roland. And 10 might be fine someplace out there where the, play, the, the industrial district is, you know, by itself someplace. So, it's all in the eye of the beholder, and I'm being generic, and if, if the generic code as it exists can't accept that, I'll be glad to, I'd like it here, but I'll be glad to consider um, some kind of more definite definition, because I'm going to ask for a lot more okay. as we go through this text. I, I agree. It's noted. We'll work on that. Thank you. Okay. I want it here. I'll get more specific if you might insist. Okay. Craft, you have? Okay. Mr. Wilder, John? I just oh. wanted to make an observation. So we got to wait for the meeting. For the Catholic. Uh, Councilwoman Clark, Clark our attorney. and Councilman Clark, uh, Kraft, I wanted to make an observation. The word minimized is used in paragraph two. And so you, you could have a similar parallel structure. You're still going to do, I think, what planning said and put it in Chapter 14. But if you look on line, uh, where are you? Line 5, page 35, look at the last word, where uh -huh. it talks about odor, smoke, noise. And if you're trying to create a parallel structure, something you may want to think about. Ah. Okay. I've seen the enemy and they are me. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. Thank you. That's why, we, okay. Um, I'll go. Thank you. Mr. O'Malley, you are. Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Peter O'Malley on behalf of Domino Sugar. I'm Passing around the amendment now. Uh, Domino is seeking an amendment to the definition of industrial maritime dependent at line 15 on page 35. Line 15, you say? Yeah. What? And this is in order to allow a uh, visitor center or interpretive area in the MI district or on an adjacent parcel to the MI use. And uh, while Domino is very pleased with how restrictive the new MI zone is, uh, we think this narrowly written amendment will help promote the MI district. In the, uh, we would 
like to see added as an inclusion, uh, Roman numeral seven, uh, the following language at uh, line 33. Facilities that are educational in nature, including but not limited to visitor centers, museums, and interpretive areas, indoor or outdoor, provided those facilities have a connection to an existing industrial maritime dependent use, whether on the same parcel or an adjacent parcel to that use. And we did consult with uh, planning. Planning's comfortable with the amendment from Domino. Any of my colleagues have? Councilman Craft. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any anyone else on page thirty-five? Okay. Uh, thirty-five is now. We are on page. 36. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. I got one. Councilman Clark, what's that, Amendment 28, page 36? I do, uh, Amendment 28. Um, there, we have pending legislation um, in uh, the um, Health Committee. I'm sorry the chair's not here, but um, uh, this is just um, fitting into this. And so, um, kennel residential, new definition, a residential property in which five or more cats or dogs or combination of cats and dogs are housed by an owner occupant who is annually licensed to maintain five such animals on the premises. It is my understanding that five is a number that our health committee may be able to live with and I would like it to be reflected as well in our code. Um, we, we would like the restoration of these um, limitations. Yeah, Councilman Kraft. Councilwoman, are you volunteering to go door to door in Southeast Baltimore and explain to people why they should allow their neighbors to have five cats and dogs? Well, right now, under the current law, they can have 500. I thought it was three. It's, no, it was taken off. The, Use the microphone again. Well, he's grabbing it because he, he's, afra he's afraid I might be hitting South Baltimore Street or, or East Baltimore Street. Or we, do we have any extra microphones so we don't have a, uh, a war? Go ahead. Um, yeah. We each want a microphone, please. Only kidding. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, um, what I learned accidentally is that my, that my legislation of many years duration to limit to three the, uh, the um, maximum number of dogs, cats you can have in a residential property, if you get to three, you have to get a kennel license, post your house, I've done it, I know what it's like, put up a sign, neighbors come out and laugh and say, are you talking about Inky? Um, but yes, and that way when you have a hoarder or somebody who's just gone crazy with usually cats, basically you have a way to, he, there's a process for that and it's done by reason of complaint. When I had such a situation and went to use this law, I've discovered that sometime during my absence from on one of my many sabbatical leaves from elective office, it was wiped off the books. So then I began to work with the health committee and with the Animal Anti-Abuse Commission um, to try to get it restored. Um, we had quite a few rocky exchanges until it was basically conceded that five might be a number that the committee could live with. So I, I'd like it also to be in the zoning code if we could just hang on. But uh, clearly we have time to double check and make sure this is going through the committee, the other committee. 
explaining? I mean, I think we would defer to health department. Uh, the number three in here was simply based, as the councilwoman suggested, on the current uh, requirements for a kennel license. If it's more than three, if um, well, but I also would note to the council if you create again, if you create a new use category, you also need to decide where that use can and cannot go, otherwise it serves no purpose as having a separate category. So if this residential kennel is permitted in all residential zones or commissional, whatever, if you would take this use category, you need to then have corresponding permissions. Well, I understand, but I got to start somewhere, and this is right now we're on page 35 and 36, 36. 36 and so here it is. Okay, all right. I want that noted. Okay, thank you. Anyone uh, else on 36? I mean, basically, clarification, please. As I read what the um, Planning Commission has put in here, that's a business. Yes, it is. And I'm talking about a the residential. I'm not sure what you're saying I'm not sure what's being said here but I'm sure they're but what 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 is being said this is yes that is correct this is a business and it has specific permissions in business zones if you create a new use you would have to add corresponding permissions that's all I'm saying oh sure and that's that's in committee right now and I've been told by um, the staff to that committee and uh, current uh, Councilman Curran's staff that five's a number. And um, it took us a while to get to that, but uh, we're there, I believe. And so, of course, I'll go back to that committee and get, I mean, we got plenty of time to get that passed if it's okay with the committee. Um, I just, now as we're on page 36 today. Okay. Any, anyone else from 36? Um, Thank you, Councilwoman. Your next is, uh, 38. 37? Any 37? Any council personal 37? Joan, you have 37? Carrie, can you pass that down to? Let's see if I can get this right. Is that working? Is that good? Okay. Um, I wanted to, uh, on the live, work, dwelling, which is on um, page thir uh, line 30. Okay, you're on 37, line 30? Yes, I am. Live, work, dwelling. I, I wanted to ask about the utility of this definition. I don't, it seems only to be um, proposed in the commercial districts, and it just doesn't, I don't really understand what it's there for, <laughs> what it does. Finish, Joan? That's, yeah. Planning? Um, it, it is intended, again, to give that uh, flexibility of the mixed use um, and to, to note that it, it, I can understand the concern that it may be considered redundant if you're in a commercial corridor that permits work, why do you need to define the, the live work? Um, but it, it was an important policy piece. As you know, this is a goal, you know, people um, to be, you know, recognize the new sort of approaches to, you know, to business that many people are working at home and that sort of thing. Also, uh, there's certain dwelling types that may um, be treated differently that way um, in the initially in the the other reason for it is in initially um, the dwellings were limited to above the ground floor versus and conditional on the ground floor and live work was not subject to that um, I, I'll have to double check but I think the Commission amend recommended amending that oh. the idea is that you're your ground floor is the more active commercial and, and on Main Street, not, you know, somebody's private home. So, so if, if it's like a, a hair cuttery or a, um, a cleaners, and they have it on the first floor and they live up on a, up on a second floor, is that what this um, The more typical live work would be a, a building that had units 
where it's, it's one and the same. You know, your office might be the front room. You know, you're a, a lawyer and you okay. have your front room as your office and you live in the back of the unit. That sort of So if you're uh, a lawyer, a CPA, someone does it. Yeah, I mean, it's taxes. a personal work decision, really. Um, but the, the reason it was called out was because of that first floor issue. It may not be necessary to be called out. Sharon, do you, you understand? Well, I mean, I've heard the explanation. I think as we go forward, we'll find out whether we need it or not. Maybe that's the answer. This is a recommendation from the Planning Commission, correct? Uh, yes, we recommend leaving it for now. Uh, anyone else on page 37? Okay, page 38. Uh, page 38, lodges and social club. I've discussed this with you before. Let me put it in its proper alphabetical order. Um, basically, on um, lines 17 and 18, add a new Roman numeral 2 under the um, inclusions of Lodge and Social Club, and that would be non-residential postgraduate fraternity and sorority centers. You will recall that we've discussed this earlier. Planning's okay with that. Also have something on. Um, we have another item on 38. Okay. Councilman Clark is. Uh, yeah, I'm just. Um, you're right. I'm on the wrong side. Yeah. Okay. Planning. Uh, uh, planning has an amendment to the definition of lot for the purposes of vertical subdivisions, um, and this came up since the drafting of the code. What line is that? Uh, that would be in line uh, uh, 23 is the definition of lot. Um, and I'm not sure we would have to defer to DLR whether it needs to be a separate, you know, numbering system there. But we need to, we are recommending adding that it means the area of a horizontal plane bounded by lot lines for the purposes of calculating development rights for a new development proposal. No such horizontal plane can be counted towards the area of, towards the lot area of multiple properties. So you have an amendment? You have, do you, That's in our list of amendments. I'm just reading it for the record. Do you have a copy of that? Yeah, it's in our, our spreadsheet. It is our line 1-3. It would be page 38, line 23 of the code. Oh, uh, 1-3. This is an unusual situation, but it, it has occurred where we've had to do vertical subdivisions. Uh, yeah, Catswoman Clark. I just have to ask what a vertical subdivision is. I'm sorry. Um, it's when you're subdividing lots this way as opposed to the sort of lines on the ground. In other words, what for you mean condominium you purposes. Right. It's like essentially the air or the building. Yeah. We've had this situations, right, right. We've had situations where within the vertical there's different ownership entities and there's, there's such thing as a vertical subdivision. Like condominiums, maybe. Right. Got it. Anything else on 38? We are now on page 39. This is all lot lines. Yeah. Nothing went 39. Okay. Uh, page 40. Joan, page 40. Thanks. I wasn't sure how, with with respect to lot width, which is um, page 40, line six through eight, 
Um, I wasn't sure how this gets used later on, but I, I wanted to observe that we have a lot of irregular shaped lots, and so, you know, I, I, there's going to be, if you have a lot, for instance, that is, I can think of two examples right now. I can think of a lot where the, the, the lot, the side lot lines are parallel, but the front is not perpendicular to those two, and then you get a different width than we would normally think of. The other example I can come up with right off the bat is a lot that is really like a very, very wide in the front and very narrow in the back. And again, it kind of, I just wondered how the code deals with those. Um, yes, this is um, actually is a new item in the code, and this was something that came up through our public uh, meeting process and, and goals, and that is um, for those who do work in a lot of the detached house districts, you know that a single family detached house has a currently under the code an R1, a 7,300 square foot lot requirement. But there's nothing in the code that speaks to the sort of proportions of that lot. And um, I know Councilwoman Spector's not here, but she's probably most familiar with it. We've had situations in Northwest Baltimore where a property owner had a 7,300 square foot lot, but it was strangely proportioned. It was very narrow and long, and they were able to squeeze a single family house on that lot without variances, but that resulting house was very out of character with that single family uh, detached area that typically had wider houses and the front porches. So a very narrow house was squeezed on. In this particular case, I believe it was a 20 foot wide house with the two required 10 foot side yards. And the lot went way back it, and it was, it, the, the resulting product was very concerning, very out of character. So in our studies related to drafting this new code, um, we came up with this minimum lot width requirement. It is only used in R1 through R4, and it basically is it's a proportion piece so that new houses have a minimum width not just a minimum lot area. And so the, the goal is based on the, it's a visual proportion, so you don't squeeze a skinny little house in a block that has these wide front porches. So that's what the definition, the only purpose of the definition is for that. And it's only used in the R1 through R4. <laughs> May I ask yeah, Councilwoman Clark. It sounds like it helps things. Uh, let me ask you this question. Um, where are you reflecting this? Do you have an amendment then that's going into the tables? It's already there. In the tables, um, in addition to lot area and um, those sorts of things, there's minimum, it would be the table seven, um, it would be title seven. Uh, I'm sorry, title eight. Table 8301, uh, 83, 8401, and it is the second line, minimum lot width. And it varies from 45 feet to in the lowest density, 100 feet. So basic, excuse me. Go ahead. So, all right, so that's where you've really The done only this. place it's used, yes. Well then, in that case, Isn't that sufficient to have it in the tables? Right, so the term is defined in order to be able to use the term in the table. So if somebody, again, with, with the recommendation is to have new terminologies that may not be otherwise used that need definition um, so that there's an understanding. If somebody well, says, well, what do they mean by minimum lot width? When they read the table, they go here and say, the lot width is the horizontal distance between the side lot lines as measured along the front lot line. And I appreciate your concern, but the reason for this to, to specifically say along the front lot line 
is back to the purpose of having lot width there, is that it's, it's a, a contextual aesthetic rule, you know, because you see the house from the front, you don't, if it's irregular, that's not, you know, you, you still have your yard requirements and your, that sort of thing. This is not instead of those other requirements, it's in addition to. So it is important that it's defined as from the front, so, not so, the width in the middle. So define minimum lot width then, because then if you define minimum lot width, which is the term you're actually using, which, the way you really want to use it, define that term, then you get rid of all the potential confusion. Just define minimum lot width. Don't define as opposed to lot as width. As opposed to lot width, because what you want, you, the term you're using is minimum lot width. So define that term. I, I think, as a matter of form, and I would defer to DLR or, or to law. I think the proper form would be to define lot width, as in, and then state a minimum. But if others have a different view on that, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, um, I think you got it nailed in the tables, and um, I don't want to have to. Uh, I think it could work both ways in this constituent situation. I mean, I got. I'm thinking about a zoning case we had um, in the thousand block of West 40th Street in Hamden. And I got gotcha. you. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I I think to, I, I I think you should reference the table. I mean, I think you should reference the tables in this definition where you're using it, so it would be clear that the two are connected. Yeah, for clarity, yeah. For clarity, we can yeah. cross-reference both ways. I think it's probably more important in the table to reference back to the definition, but, but either way. Um, for a note on the cross-references um, for the council's purposes, when we drafted this code, we envisioned it being available um, once adopted in an electronic form that would have uh, both textual as well as electronic cross-references. So if you went to a table, for example, and said minimum lot width, it would be a link that would automatically take you back to the definition. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> the first thing people are going to go to, didn't someone say this in this room the other day, is the tables. Correct. I mean, basically, that's where I start. So, if, if I, I don't think I've ever read the definitions in the current code until I had to because I had to see how they connected with these. And well, but I never miss them. But basically, let's just cross-reference these and yeah. call it minimum lot line Thank and move on. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, anyone else on page 40? Okay, now we'll go to page 41. Laurie. Yes, the Planning Commission um, had a minor item on, relatively minor item, I guess, on page 41. Uh, it is uh, line six, and uh, the su suggestion is to specify that this use does not include purchase of materials from the public on site and that it is not a junk and scrapyard. In other words, to add to materials recovery a exclusion, that it is excludes junk and scrap and that it is not um, for the public on-site consumption because that is essentially what a junkyard is. You go there and you buy the uh, other pieces. So purchase, excludes purchase. Was right, so we're, we're recommending excluding purchase, on-site purchase of materials by the public and not a junk and scrap storage yard. Okay. Uh, it's actually our 1-12. Page 
Anyone else on page 41? We are now on page 42. Thing go, to, go to 42, page 43. Good on page 43. Now we're on page 44, Councilwoman Clark. Thank you. Um, this is one of the bait noirs of my life in the zoning code. Neighborhood commercial establishment. It is on lines 14 through 17. Um, there are two instances in this zoning code in which, with very little process at all, what we think is a residential property can turn into a commercial property just like that. Um, our residential and detached MUs later on in this novel, um, at least you can take them out of your district. I mean, they're overlays and you can amend them out if, you, if you're worried about them, which I am, and councilmanic courtesy should prevail that you got rid of them. Neighborhood commercial, it's like, you, it's so, per, it's so, such a stealth thing, there's no way to get your hands on it in advance. And so I, I, I what I did was, if you will bear with me for a moment, I did a little appendix that is right, uh, that is a couple pages in your notes further along. I, I just want to dwell on it for a moment, or a couple moments, if I may. This is one of, this is a big deal, big deal. It's, this is, uh, this definition, uh, let me, I wrote this, so let me read it to you, <clears throat> appears to define a current non-conforming use within, a, within the new zoning code. In other words, it looks like a definition for something that's existing. Um, however, it is, in other words, basically, there's no provision for as in the current code, that if that basically non-conforming use is terminated, there's an abandonment reprieve where you can, where the property goes back to residentially used. Okay, I mean, all right? But that's what it looks like. But that's not really what it is. It's really a definition about creating the opportunity for conversion of certain residentially zoned and even residentially occupied properties to commercial use without a public process and by reason of such subjective factors as construction and use. What is it, is this construction? Um, and if it's about use and it's there now, why don't we zone it commercial? What happens though is that, and who determines that it's okay that, the, that it looks like a store or it looks like it might have been commercial or something, and so okay it can be with basically no process and it could be next door. Now, let me go forward, although you don't want Lycas to, to use standards. 
I'll just, I wrote them here so we don't even have to turn a page. That indeed, the use standards confirm that these are indeed proposed, proposed uses in residential neighborhoods. They give you seven categories of commercial uses that can go into neighborhood commercial. These are residentially zoned properties. Um, and, you know, two of them are real vague, but they are art galleries, art studios, daycare centers, offices, personal services establishments, restaurants, retail goods establishments, another generic wonder. Um, and there are certain parking allowances, sign restrictions, drive-through and outside storage prohibitions, and C1 sign regulations. How do you get to be one of these things? First of all, I don't want one. If you got a place like this, propose commercial zoning and let it stand the, you know, the test of review by the community and the council. If you want it to be some, if you want it residential now, but you don't want it to call, you don't want to call residential non-conforming. So you want to call it something else, don't. This code is supposed to be as clear as possible, and this is, this is, I don't mean anybody meant to be stealthy. This is a stealth provision that needs to leave this code now. Thank you. Councilman Kress, and then, yeah. Yeah, and, and I pose um, a question, and maybe Laurie can answer it, but the way that I read this, just sort of tagging on to what Councilwoman Clark is saying, is I look at my district, and in every, I don't want to say every, because you never say every or never or all, but in virtually every block in southeast Baltimore, there is a building that at one time was a grocery store or a bar or a barber shop, but at some point it had some commercial usage, and you can tell because it still has the commercial storefront on it. And the vast majority of these over the years have been converted to homes, but they still are, they still have the commercial storefront. And occasionally, and we have two of them within the last 30 days where people have come in and said, well, I'd like to have a photo studio here. I'm gonna live upstairs, but I'd like to sell my, I'm a photographer, I'd like to sell my stuff downstairs. But they have to go through the process. They have to go through the zoning process. They have to go through that. They have to go to their neighbors. They have to go through, you know, all of the things that we want them to go through. The way that that I'm reading this is it isn't going to be quite so, for lack of a better word, difficult. Um, and in those instances also they have to show that there has been a continued use uh, of some sort for the commercial. What I don't want is I don't want a building that has been a house or a residence that, and has been a residence for three or four or five years or 15 or 20 years, and all of a sudden somebody shows up and says, oh, I think I'm gonna make this a bodega. You know, when there's already 14 of them in three blocks. Um, and I'm just using that as a particular example because we have that one happening on Eastern Avenue right now. So, is that what it means? What was, your, what was your director, what was Planning Commission's director for this? Well, yeah, let me start with the, sort of the big picture here. Um, so to Councilman Kraft's, uh, Clark's point, yes, this is an opportunity for creating new uses. Um, it is not intended to be sneaky or backhanded or anything else. Um, and the, the background and the history on that is that we, in, in our city, as an older, diverse, eclectic neighborhoods, we have many non-residential buildings th 
cheek and jowl in our residential neighborhoods. And this concept of neighborhood commercial came out of lots of discussions um, as to how to address that and lots of items that we've seen. Um, uh, one example, uh, there have been numerous examples of churches. Um, for whatever reasons, there's a lot of purpose-built churches that um, have gone empty and have come in for a, an office use. That seems to be the most common. Um, you know, obviously if the church wants to be a residential use, that's permitted. But if the empty church wants to be used for an office, there are no tools for that under our current zoning code short of a rezoning. Those rezonings in the middle of a residential block do not meet standards for rezoning, typically. Some of them may, depending on the character of the area, but our findings against the land use article, Planning Commission's required findings, have been that many do not meet standards. It's an expensive process. It's a time-consuming process. The recommendation for the neighborhood commercial is that these uses would have to go to the board they're not as of right. There is a public process. And I think I, th there's one currently, actually I've gotten a call, I don't know if it's the same one in Highland Town, where someone uh, wants to use a previous storefront for, it was an art, I'm not sure if it's the same one, um, a gallery purposes. We've been working with Southeast CDC on this. And there really is not a tool under our current code for that provision, even though it had been a commercial building. So I, I understand, I think I understand the council's um, concerns about this, and maybe it is op too open-ended, maybe it needs some modification, but this is something that really came to us out of a lot of grassroots work a lot of wanting to reuse empty buildings, older buildings, quirky buildings for purposes that are generally could be compatible with the residential areas. Um, and we have examples probably in most all of the councilmatic districts of this. Um, we would like to you know, work with the council if there needs to be modifications. Maybe the seven uses are too much, um, and that we would be open to well, that. Uh, we we just would be that would be very problematic to totally prohibit this. Yep, um, Laurie, I know. Okay, Laurie, it's not the side of the argument you're making uh, where you have the church that w that's closed that wants to to convert into some other usage because in most cases at least in my experience in most cases those things happen it takes a little time but it happens it's the other side it's this it's the side where um, the little church sprouts up in the middle of the block because there was a, a storefront. But more often than not, it's, it's, you know, somebody knows Jane, and Jane wants to open up a coffee shop on the corner, and everybody likes Jane, she's a nice person, and they all think, oh, it's great, let's let Jane have her coffee shop on the corner. And then when you sit down and you talk to people and say, well, that's fine, but suppose Jane gets hit by a car tomorrow and you've given her permission to go in there and her heirs sell that property, you're not giving the zoning to Jane, you're not giving it to Jane for a coffee shop, you're giving it permission to use whatever is qualified under that thing, you know, and we start opening that up. The other thing is, and I, I can only speak for myself, but I'm very reluctant to give, I want to reduce the number of conditional uses that I give to the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals because, you know, the, the, the condition of giving them to the BMZA is on the condition that you show up. 
And, you know, that has been so destructive to my neighborhoods. And, um, and we have had so many times where everybody in the neighborhood has been opposed to them, to, to what they've done. Communities have come down, and the BMZA just says, great. You can have what you want. It's a conditional use. So, you know, don't try to sell me on the fact that anybody's going to be protected by the BMZA. Okay, Joan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to add a couple of two cents or three cents to this. Uh, just in talking about the, the definition alone, with, and this is the first time Mr. Willis has been here when we've had any of these discussions. Um, you know, just looking at the definition, and I've, I mentioned this before, we're, what I think we're dealing with is just built-in ambiguity, and that's certainly something we don't want to have in, the, in this code. You, you, you have all these terms in this definition that are not defined in the code, yet you're making this definition of out of all these undefined terms. For instance, what is a residential neighborhood? What determines what that is? Both of those terms are undefined, and the definition of a neighborhood or the identification of a neighborhood is actually the subject of numerous appellate cases. So this isn't a simple thing anyway. Um, who determines what the original use of a structure is when the structures go back 100 years and more and we don't have records on those things? And, and the original construction, this is so ambiguous. Um, it, it just, you know, I, 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 so, and we know that if it's ambiguous, they always go back to the legislative intent. Well, we already have legislative intent, and, and Councilman Kraft is right on, because we've already seen in the record of this bill are photographs of the corner store, of photographs of the storefront. It's there in the record. Planning does intend for this to be used for those kind of properties. It's already in the record there's a photograph. It's not the church. It's the other thing that's going to that's gonna trip us up. So, you know, one of the things, and we, now I know we're not supposed to talk about the tables, but just mentioning the tables. If you want any of these uses to be conditional uses in the residential district, then put them in the table as conditional uses in the residential district. I mean, that's another way to do it. That takes away the stealth aspect of it anyway. I'm not saying that that's, I'm just saying that when you do that, when you just say, okay, let's put personal services establishment as a conditional use in the R8, then everybody can see the stealth is taken away and everybody understands and then you could have that debate. That's what I wanted to say. Okay, Mr. Um, Baer, you. Uh, good morning, uh, Al Barry, Baltimore Development Work Group. I want to give a little historical perspective and support the planning department's idea behind this. And when I started under the new, the current zoning code in the 70s, there were literally hundreds, if not multiples of hundreds, of vacant properties throughout Baltimore that were that were um, could not be used because the previous non-conforming phase out kicked into effect either one year or 18 months. And the planning department and it was getting all these requests to come in for people to reopen those as legitimate uses, many with community support, but not all, admittedly, that either had two choices. You either had to convert it back to a res these are vacant structures, commercial structures. So you either had to get it rezoned and you, let, you went into the issues that Laurie talked about, do you meet the standards for rezoning, where you do, you just leave it vacant. And I drafted back in the 70s, I think 74, 75, a bill that applied to the upper density residential zones, we had R6 through R10 perhaps, that basically gave the zoning board the authority, putting aside whether they should have had it as opposed to the council or some other process, the ability to convert to a commercial use. And that was seen by communities throughout the city and certainly the city administration that that type of review that would change over time, that if it changed from an art gallery to something else, you had to go back through a process, right or wrong, as opposed to commercial zoning, which Councilman Clark suggested might be the answer for some of these in her district, where you don't have any controls then over what uses come back, you know, six months from now or three years from now. So there's, that was the policy back in the 70s. Unfortunately, in my opinion, and I think our opinion that have been studying this, the fact that you resign 
vacant commercial buildings to either get rezoning or some reasonable use with some reasonable process is a legitimate uh, aspect to put in this new zoning code. Whether it's the zoning board or some other process, we can all sort of discuss that. I don't think it was ever uh, the intention, perhaps, of when we looked at it, that you had a use that was converted to a house and then could go back to a commercial use that you mentioned, Councilman Kraft. I think that's a legitimate, maybe, restriction that, that should be looked at. But the, I, the principle here, I think, is legitimate. I think the council shouldn't just take the position that all of these uses are inherently bad, because I'm at the zoning board every other week, and there are literally, in the course of a year, hundreds of properties that are commercial properties, frankly, that are built as shopping centers, in some cases, that cannot be used because the, the storefront was vacant for over a year. That's unrealistic in terms of reuse. I don't think it's what anybody wants. And so this needs a lot of work, but I think the principle is that planning is on the right direction. And, and I think that we're not going to resolve this today. I think we should it's put it be on the record for this. Yeah, it's under discussion on the record. Councilman Clark, you want to just wrap one it up? thing to say, um, and it's it's simply this: um, detached mixed use and residential mixed use. The planning commission, I, I don't like them, but I know where they are. I can take them away in my district. And I don't think anybody will argue with me. And that's, those amendments are already a matter of public record for my district. If, but the planning commission in this instance hasn't told us, shown us, identified. No, no, no. The, the, the drafters of this, of, of this proposed ordinance, we don't know what they're talking about. And we never will until the first constituent picks up the phone and says, you're not going to believe this, but. And then we'll say, oh, gee, who knew? And then we'll go back and read this and say, oh, I guess. And then it goes, and then the next time we have a chance to talk about it, we're at the zoning board where the rule is that the, the burden of proof is on the opponent to a conditional use sought by the applicant. We go into conditional use hearings knowing the deck is stacked against us. So that's those are the problems and it's just too mysterious if the, if there are specific buildings in every district that need this then let's talk about those specific buildings now while we're doing something and um not about some generic problem i'd be glad to talk about the specific buildings we can spot zone during a comprehensive rezoning if uh, the, and so we now is the moment. If that, there are such creatures out there, tell us what they are so the neighborhoods can see them and, and say what they want. Yeah, yeah. Are, are there zoning lawyers? Um, two, two minor follow up points. As far as the conditional use process, um, we are open to working with the council uh, board. You know, if this becomes by ordinance, that so be it. Um, and I think that you'll note we've maintained the revocation provisions of conditional use um, that you have established in this current code, and that would be important in these uses. If you rezone something to commercial to address what you're suggesting, you will not have the revocation that you have as a conditional use. So that's a caution. Um, in terms of treating it as a zoning matter, even if you do it at this time. There is no revocation. Um, in terms of uh, the comments on residential neighborhood, that could be changed to residential zone. That would be fine. The determination, as was brought up, is always the zoning administrators subject to challenge. And then complaining, go ahead and put, put that on paper and submit it to the committee what you just said about some of the changes because we're going to under discuss these aren't that. changes i think this is really just answering the questions um i i think okay, All right. okay. 
<laughs> Mr. Barry, you can stay up and sit up here if you wish. It's, That's okay. 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 All right. huh. okay um, anything else on page 44? Okay. Uh, now we are on page 45, Councilwoman Clark. Well, yes, um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, line 11. Um, I, I think this came up earlier. I'm sorry. I mean, earlier, like around this table in one of these work sessions, I, I was just um, deleting where it says that the definition of office excludes government office. Um, I just took that out. I, an office is an office and a government office is an office. I don't know why. Um, yes, that did come up earlier and um, as I noted before, planning will relook at that whether we need. The reason to, again, exclude it is because you're treating them differently and there are circumstances where we were more permissive on government offices than offices in yeah. general, such as in a park, you only want a government office related right. to the park. So in order to be able to treat them differently, that is the reason for the exclusion. So you can be more permissive, say on the government office where it's located, as opposed to office general. Like, uh, so, in other words, it's for definition purposes. Yeah. Correct. Like a Trude Hill Park with recreation. Yeah, I understand right. what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason. It's not. It's not that they. Mm -hmm. It's not that they are different so, animals in the in and of themselves. They have a def different place on the use. Uh, exactly. The use tables. Exactly. And okay, that's the reason I, to break I, them. Apart. I got you. That's fine. Um, I got it. That's the only one you had, right, Councilwoman? On that page. Yeah. Um, Joan. Uh, no, wait a minute. Where am I? What page am I on? Creating overlay district, which yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I I'm page 45. So you you want to respond to? No, no. Okay, Councilwoman Clark. Overlay district. Okay, so I, I'm trying to say so a lot. I'm trying to get good generation here. That would actually be after the use, wouldn't it? That would yeah, that would be, be uh, uh, that's after office, yeah. That would actually be after outdoor something. It would be on page 46, it would be. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Page 46? Yeah. Okay. okay, let's stay on 45. Uh, okay, for 45 on line 16 through 18. Uh, what line? 45 on line what? 16 through 18, Mr. Chair. 16 through 18. Outdoor dining? Yeah, I think... Um, there are different kinds of outdoor dining, and I, I feel like there needs to be a distinction in, in, the, in the next code on this. It's, it's a very different, a place where people simply sit and eat, consume food, is a very different place from what is effectively a, a service area, an outdoor service area where people are waited on and they pay their bill and they have menus and the, the waitress goes in and out or waiter goes in and out and in and out. Those are very different things with very different impacts. And then there's also the issue of whether these are on private property or on public property. And there are a lot of different issues that come up in when you get to the point of deciding whether you, know, you want this to happen or not. So I, I feel like the definition is not adequate yet or that needs to be broken down perhaps. Yeah, go ahead. Councilman Cribb, because you have a lot of them. Yeah, we, we, have a, we have a lot of those in Southeast Baltimore in, you know, in Fells and you know, O'Donnell and those areas where um, you have people that, you know, you, uh, and I'll use like the daily grind as, as a good example, where there are tables outside where folks can go and they buy their coffee and their buns or something like that, and then they go outside and they just sit there and eat. And there's a number of other places like that, particularly when the weather gets nice, where there are lots of tables sitting outside, but all the um, there's no service outside, as opposed to when you go to like O'Donnell Square and the majority of the tables outside there are all service tables. Um, I think there clearly has to be some sort of distinction between the two. Um, 
I would defer to you know the council on that, but please read 14.329, the detailed standards for outdoor dining. Um, the, the notion of the property is there because it references minor privilege if it's uh, needed. Uh, and some of the details, whatever the council decides on this, and, and, and um, it's very important for enforcement purposes to have the standards outlined so that um, I know in Southeast and in other areas, the outdoor dining is individual conditional uses, which makes it very challenging because you could go, an inspector could walk down a block and one business's conditional use said three tables and a five foot aisle and another one said two tables and a six foot aisle, et cetera, down the block, which is a nightmare for an inspector because he's got to have all of that in front of him to figure out who's violating their rules. And what we worked hard to try to get at here is a consistent set of standards for all of them. So I would hope that when we get to 14, 329, um, that some of those pieces go there. It, just for the record, it is really very, very important for enforcement to have consistent dining standards. I think one of the things that would lend to consistency really would be whether there is outdoor service or there is an outdoor service because I know that's one of the fights that goes on regularly when they go to conditional uses is, you know, are they serving? Because the owners come in and say, you know, we're not doing outdoor service. You know, all we want to do is set the tables out there. And that's an argument that they make as to why um, they should get their tables as opposed to people that are serving, um, you know, they're, I mean, they're, they're making a distinction. So I think, you know, if they're going to make a distinction, then we should make a distinction, and that would I, help I out. No, I have no problem with the distinction, um, but again, uh, the standards are what are really critical. Well, and let me just add to what Councilman Kraft said and, and to what Ms. Feinberg said. I. I don't quite understand why with the kinds of electronic devices we have and the kind of electronic records we have now, why it should be a problem in the future for enforcement. Because it would seem to me that every establishment, every address would be on record as what it's supposed to have and what it's not supposed to have. And that's how you do the enforcement. And it's not one size fits all. Any, anyone else on uh, page 45? What is your uh, your overlay dish? What's that? What page is that? Is that on? Forty six at the top. Okay, uh, we're done with. Anyone else on page forty five? It would be my. I, okay, page forty six, Councilwoman Clark. Yeah, um, forty six. I would like to um, introduce a new definition. Overlay district. It would go in right after line eight, eighteen. Um, and here's what it would say. So this this would be what after 17 outdoor theater. Um, Number two illustration. No, it would be after. Uh, yes, exactly. I'm sorry, Councilman. Okay. Um, an overlay district is a zoning district. We get to these in a later chapter. Um, for which restrictions or uses exceed provisions of the underlying zoning district. Amendments to existing over, uh oh, typo, sorry, lay districts, including their boundaries and adoption of new overlay districts, their boundaries and conditions, require approval by ordinance of the Baltimore City Council. That's all. I just want to make sure that all these overlay things. Um, right or defined right up front that they got a that we are in that we got them like we have buds or like we have them now. Yeah. Um, 
We have, um, in, in conferring with law, uh, that, that is the case as drafted, that the overlay districts can only be changed by, the, by ordinance. Um, that is certainly the intent. Um, we have no problem with the addition of a definition. Uh, the process should probably be in Title V, but um, again, we have no disagreement with the substance of the council person. Okay, good. Oh, Title V, I hope the President's Title V amendments include this then. Well, a PUD is kind of the model overlay when you think about it, and then they sort of increase. Uh, uh, Others. A PUD can only be created or amended, uh, the major amendments by the council. It is in Title 13, but the procedures, procedures for all steps are in five. Well, wait a minute. It, it, my, my question, the reason I asked the question is, is a PUD an overlay? Is that, it is, okay. So if the PUD is an overlay, right, um, if it says amendments to existing overlay districts, including their boundaries, adoption of new overlay districts, boundary condition require approval by ordinance, that doesn't distinguish between major and minor. So if we take this definition, then any amendment to the PUD would have to be done by ordinance if we use this definition would that be a fair interpretation as drafted uh, title 13 currently makes very clear distinctions between major and minor um, so it's not a the answer is no okay um, basically I'll be glad to add puds in here um, this is my amendment I'll be glad to put them in so there's no uh, so there's no lack of clarification. You know, I've got, so basically, reference to the current draft is not too helpful because PUDs in the current draft, we have to wait for the Planning Commission to spend several years going through a process before we're permitted in the current draft to introduce a PUD. Clearly, this is going to be amended. But we're not at that title yet. But I would be glad to add the planned unit development, including planned unit development, to this definition with, with your approval, Mr. Chairman. Yes, yes. As a draft. Thank you. The, the only correction, I don't think it takes several years for planning to. I, I'm sorry. It, it's a long process, process before we are allowed, before planning lets us introduce a PUD. And then after we've approved a PUD, it goes back for them to make sure we did it right. I just don't want to listen to the audience think it takes planning. No, no, no. I, I'm just being, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but not much. Okay, thank you. Um, That's going in here. Yeah, okay. Uh, any, anyone else on 46? Okay, we're now on 47. 47, page 47. You're 48. Uh, 40, nothing on 47? Okay, now we are on page 48 with Mary Pat Clark, Councilwoman Clark. Page 48, line four. Oh, parks and playgrounds, yes. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I just wanted to add on page 48, um, there are, excuse me, let me orient, on um, uh, line four, um, oh, there are, yeah, all kinds of places, uh, 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 parks and playgrounds include, and then there's a list. And, you know, it says things like exercise stations, skateboarding areas, etc. cetera. Um, and on line, or under number, Roman numeral three, it says, what am I doing here? Wait a minute. Have I got this wrong? Pet areas. I saw, oh, pet areas. Four. Okay, I did, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I've got the wrong um, Roman numeral. Please let me correct you. Um, IV, which is four. Um, four, I'm adding to pet areas 
that the language on le on leash unless in areas city approved in public parks for off leash and enclosed pet recreation. Um, I know I'm trying to do animal control as part of, but it's the law, and um, I need it to be. I'd like it to be reiterated here. It's not just the park is not a pet area. Parts of it are on, yeah, on leash, yes. But then off leash, um, I just want it sort of clarified. I'm having you know, it, it, issues. From, from, the, from, the, from the law department standpoint, I mean, you're, you're, you're adding in something that really isn't, that, that is related in some other part of the code. And so, you know, we have an issue with just sort of layering it in a zoning ordinance. You know, if it's, if it, I mean, I, and I, it's hard to sort of come up with it. Is it, if, the, if it's, at the end, it's de minimis that really doesn't change anything, I suppose it's probably okay. But I mean, that's, anytime we have a definition and you're going a little further than just a definition, then we're gonna say, wait, hold on. The, my, my concern about that is that the law is that dogs have to be on leash in parks. The, if you just put on leash in pet areas, then I think someone may, no, no, no. then someone may be, draw the inference that in these other areas, they don't have to be on leash um, because you're having a distinction in pet areas, but you're not having a distinction in the other areas. And so I think you may be creating a problem in the other areas. But what I'm trying to do is say... Why don't you say dog parks instead of pet areas or something like that? But I, because but dog I, parks I are... Want, is that good? Dog parks? I don't be, want the whole park to be considered a pet area if what people take from it is, here's be, my dog, Because dog goes. parks are enclosed pet areas where, I mean, you know, maybe we need to de 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 define dog parks. Are we distinguishing in the zoning code between pet areas and, and dog? In other words, we need the definition assuming that we've got something in the code that sort of deals with that. Well, we don't, I mean, I'm not aware of quote unquote pet areas in any of our parks other than dog parks. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I don't know that there are. Are there? Yeah, you gotta use the microphone, yeah. Before, before you answer, we, we are, we, we're joined by Councilwoman, uh, Sharon Gray Middleton, Thank you, Mr. and also uh, Mr. Bill Driscoll from Council President Jack Young's office, and Michelle Wurzberger from President Jack Young's office. Go ahead. Hey, for our uh, rec and parks, uh, I would say that dog parks are the only pet areas in parks, and so I would say that I would recommend that you say dog parks be listed. Because by that you mean that's official. That's where you take the dog. Right. Right. Okay, I'm good with that. I just so you change it to pet area to dog park. I'll change area to park and call it a day. That's fine with me. Thank you. Could I actually make one recommendation? Could I suggest, since this is a list and it's inclusive but not exclusive of anything, not referencing dogs or pets at all here? Um, it, it, it doesn't really serve a great purpose. The health code allows for off-leash areas. There aren't any off-leash areas allowed. I mean, saying dog park versus pet area versus just, I mean, just strike delete it. it. Just delete I'm it. happy with that as long as I wasn't the one that made that motion. Okay, as long as in my temporary president of Friends of Wyman Park Dell who deals with this issue, we'd rather, I think, not have that listed as something. Second the motion. Okay, we're all in agreement. Okay. And end of discussion. Anything else on page four? 48. Okay. Uh, page 49. Mr. Chairman, a uh, law department has a, uh, an amendment that we would like. Uh, this code doesn't uh, identify person, doesn't define what, person. What line? This would be right after line 8. After line eight on page 49. We would include, 
on page 49, we would include the definition that now exists in the current code for person. And the idea there is that we're trying to distinguish, in some cases when we talk about person, we're really talking about entities, we're talking about individuals. We're, sometimes we're talking about individuals, sometimes we're talking about entities. So for example, when we have a penalty, we have things like any person who violates this code, and if we didn't have a definition, as we typically do, saying a person also is an entity, some entities could be violating a code and we wouldn't be able to get them. So, uh, I've had this conversation with Avery. We just need to go through and, and be clear, one, that we put this definition of person, and I can read that if you would like, uh, yeah, okay. and then go through the rest of the code and making sure that we are clear that when we meet individual, we meet an individual, and when we meet something broader that we use this term person. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you, Victor. Any, Joan? I guess I just had a question or an observation about lines 9 through 20, the personal services establishment. 9 through what? 9 through 20, which is personal services establishment. And I, I guess my first thing would be a question to say, is this intended as a, what you call a generic use? Um, and, and then it might be, one of the things that might be useful in this whole code is to actually just state that something is a generic use, perhaps it might be useful. But this, this is a pretty broad list. Um, you know, everything from animal grooming to uh, laundromats. And I just wonder, you know, it's, it's, it, it comes under some scrutiny for us because it falls under the neighborhood commercial. That's one of the, you know, one of the issues. It's a really broad list, and I just wondered about that, whether we can handle something quite, quite so broad. That's, Councilman Kraft? I'd like to tag on to that um, because I've looked at this myself and, you know, personal services establishment, this would be a lawyer or a CPA, um, you know, I mean, it, this is literally an, an A to Z. Um, Not intended to be offices. But. but it doesn't say that. It says a personal services establishment. You could have a, a lawyer or a CPA or someone like that who has an office in their home, uh, you know, literally a room in their home that serves as an office and they could be providing personal services from there. It's not a formal quote unquote office, but it would be a personal service, um, for lack of a word, establishment. Um, the, um, you know, particularly when you have massage therapists or other similar who do do um, some of that stuff at home, so. This would not be intended under, there's a, we have a, a home occupation would be for home uses. This is again for the purposes of creating a use in the use tables and personal but, services are permitted uses in commercial areas, conditional under the neighborhood commercial. Um, home occupation, as you know, we've, we've gotten to that already, is specifically defined uh, separately and has extensive use standards in terms of its size and we're impact and that not, sort of thing. not arguing that point with you. What we're saying is when you have illustrations and typical examples of quote unquote personal services establishment, that the examples of personal services establishment could, there are other things that could easily fit we into those examples. can add exclusions. Yeah. Clear, right. okay. Yeah. We, we, we could add exclusions if that would clarify it. Okay. Uh, anyone else showing page 49? Okay, we're now on page 50. Um, I already went through the definition of promoter um, at an earlier session because it's connected with the definition of banquet hall. I just want to say that that definition of promoter is Amendment 5 in this title, 
my, my Amendment 5 in this title, and it fits right in here after line 28 on page 50. Thank you. Anyone else on page 50? We are now on page 51. Uh, we're down with page 52. Two, uh, page 53, page 54, I like this, 54, page, uh, 55, yeah, 55, 55 uh, Councilwoman Clark. Uh, yes, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, mine is on page 55 after line 32. It is retail big box and um, actually um, Mr. Lynch is here at the table to um, talk about the definition, etc. Okay, so let me get it. So we're on page 55, and this is after line 32. Yeah. And you want to add a new category and definition? Yeah, I'm calling it retail big box establishment. Uh, establishment. You might want to change it later, but I thought it'd be nice to hear it today, and alphabetically that works. Okay, and, and this is a companion, companion amendment to the commercial table also? Uh, uh, okay. yeah, and let me let me just say that I'm I am supportive of these amendments. They are coming from an organization that, that, that and I'm I'm adding them in as a part of my own. But they are they are being um, they have been developed and there's been a study done and and Mr. Lynch is here to fill us in on that. And it is very important in terms of the retail part of this establishment. Hey, Mr. Lynch, speak it. Yeah, in, introduce yourself and who you represent. Speak into the microphone because we'll be in televised. Okay. Um, my name is David Lynch. I'm an attorney from the law office of G. Macy Nelson. I'm representing Ben Ray, who's a citizen of Baltimore. Um, before I speak, I have some materials I'd like to submit to the committee. Uh. Yeah, she, you know what it is? I mean, you want to bring the microphone closer to you? Casper Kraft has a question, Mr. Lynch. So your recommendation is that the definition for a big box establishment um, begins at 75,000 square feet. That would constitute a big box establishment? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Um, no, that's perfect for me. No, thank you very much. <laughs> and what I, what I just submitted um, to the committee, it's a report prepared by Professor Jennifer Evans Cowley. Um, she's a um, land use expert and a professor at um, Ohio State University and teaches uh, in the regional, um, city and regional planning department. Um, and what she did is she, she reviewed uh, the proposed code, um, and she evaluated the treatment of big box retail. Um, and she came to the conclusion that, it's not hard, I think, to come to this conclusion, that under the current proposed code, there's absolutely no differentiation between uh, retail uses of a general nature and a big box retail use. And the reason that this is an important distinction is that there's numerous impacts that big box stores 
have that other retail um, does not. Um, there are a number of impacts, but I think the primary impacts are related to traffic and the economic impacts. Um, and this report, um, you know, goes through all those impacts, and it has, you know, citations to all um, the planning literature. Um, economically, um, the studies have shown that small businesses are put out of business by um, big box retail. And also, big box retail generally brings in low wages to communities, and it lowers the overall um, economic um, sustainability of that area. Um, so for those reasons, you know, we're proposing an amendment to the code to define big box retail. And in order to regulate big box stores, um, the starting point is to have a definition of what a big box retail store is. Um, and our proposal is, um, you know, it's detailed in Councilwoman Clark's amendment here. Um, you know, it's any single use commercial building, whether standalone or within a multi building development, so it would include, you know, large, you know, strip center or other stores, um, wherein such single use establishment occupies at least 75,000 square feet of gross leasable area. Um, now, the 75,000 square feet number, um, you know, there's no scientific number, you know, reason to arrive at that number. However, um, it would exclude stores such as grocery stores and other, you know, smaller um, retail uses. Really, um, traditional big box stores are 75,000 uh, square feet or greater. Um, so the first part of our proposal is to define a big box store. Um, and the second part is to amend the land use table. Now, I'm not sure if I should you know, speak to that now. Um, Right here. And what okay. I wrote, say what I Microphone. Wrote. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, Put it together, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And um, so the second part would be to amend the land use table using the existing zoning categories um, and just allow a big box retail store in the C3, C4, and C5 zones, but as a conditional use, which would allow um, you know a site-specific analysis of that proposal. Um, and a key component of the conditional use would be the third part of the proposal, um, which would require an economic impact study um, be done, you know, with the associated, you know, impacts of that store. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the uh, proposal. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I add one thing? Yeah, Councilman Clark. Uh, yes. Um, of course, Mr. Lynch is working off the draft in which there is only one kind of conditional use zoning board. But of course, I'm presuming this council will want to restore uh, conditional use by ordinance. And I have, and these are my amendments as well, my part of this amendment is to put it in um, conditional by ordinance of the city council. Okay. Okay. That way we have we in the council can review the economic impact study about how it's going to affect the other businesses in existing in our communities. Okay. Um, For the record, Planning Commission rejected this amendment, but we would defer to BDC on the topic. BDC? Yes, give. Thank you. Um, Kristen Mitchell for the Baltimore Development Corporation. Um, we would uh, respectfully like to request that we discuss the uh, use tables and the um, Title 14 um, amendments uh, for the use standards further down the line so we have more time to review these. Okay, so you, you're going to talk to... Uh Okay. Yeah, I mean, just in the in the interest of going through methodically as you've been going page by page through the document, we'd like to um, request that we have the opportunity to uh, discuss this a little bit further and come back to it, you know, um, okay. in that process Pencil. that you've been using. Yeah. Wait, Rich, are you finished? Uh, Ms. Yes. Mitchell, Ms. Mitchell, um, so you'll get together with... Um, yes. Okay. So you have... So... Uh, the, the definition part, because we are there, meets with your approval. Um, we, we have no comments on the definition, um, but I think we'd like to discuss the other items sequentially, if we can. And That's great. So, so moving on to tables and use standards. Thank you. Thank you.
Councillor Craig. Mr. Lynch, I just want to thank you for this because I have been meeting with a development team for a project in my district and I have been telling them that I would not give them 75,000 square feet for any single retail user because I didn't want a big box there. And they've been telling me that you can't get a big box unless it's 100,000 square feet or more. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Just hang in there. Okay, um, we are, f anyone else on page 55? Okay. Um, page 55, we have a minor correction. Yeah, go ahead. Um, similar to before for um, item line eight, resource recovery, to add the exclusion uh, not for junk or scrapyard. Okay, not junk, okay. Add the exclusion, um, actually I think the exclusion would go under line 15. Uh, one dash nine. Page fifty five. Okay, we're not going. This is, um, yes, uh, it is now, the rule was just for two hours, it is now 12 o'clock, so we will go on recess. So the next work session on City Council Bill 12 0152, Transform Baltimore Moore Zoning will be held on Thursday, Thursday, February 20th at 5 p.m. Um, we will begin where we ended this morning on page 55. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending the land use and transportation work session. Please check the area around you. Make sure you take everything with you that you brought. Uh, we will be closing the room shortly. Thank you.